Science. What wonders you reveal. Regular discoveries of Earth-like planets, particle accelerators that reveal the building blocks of the universe, and engineering feats that allow rockets to carry satellites into orbit only to turn around and land themselves back on Earth intact. Amazing. However, when it comes to music and sound, you do sometimes disappoint, and it seems that for every genius you provide, you also impose attacks of one twat. A twat with an unfortunate predilection for synthesizers and tall tales. So what am I talking about? Well, just listen to this. So the process used to create this is called sonification, and when I first heard it, I just knew something fishy was up. And it's not just the fact that you can't hear anything in space because there are no air molecules for sound to travel through. Yeah, when I heard this recording, it wasn't the hand of God that I perceived, but it was rather the scuff marks of a total chancer. I mean, how was this sound obtained? Is it really the thing itself? But before I get into the bad aspects of sonification, let's just take a look at its potential and how it could be really cool. So sonification is the method people use to turn data into sound. Two good examples of basic sonification are this, and also this. Seven. Six. Can't be, that's inside the room. So for both of these examples, abstract audio was chosen to represent events in time. And that's how the sound you heard in the intro was created too. So right off the bat we can answer my first question. No, this isn't the sound of the thing itself, in the same way that this isn't the sound of this. So, what's the benefit? Well, let's take a step back for perspective. Data presents a problem for us stupid humans. It's often very detailed and tedious to sort through, so over the years we've developed a myriad of visual representations that help us to quickly gain insight and recognise patterns at a glance. Just compare this to this. However, there's a wealth of data that, for one reason or another, can't be meaningfully conveyed by graphs or heat maps, which leads us to an interesting question. Is there a special type of insight that sonified data can offer us which visual representation can't? This is the type of question being researched by members of the International Conference for Auditory Display, or ICAD, where researchers work towards a day where we might rely quite heavily on sound to understand things. Imagine wanting to know the latest on the FTSE 100 and being played this. But more seriously, another enticing aspect of sonification is accessibility for people who are partially sighted or blind. This astronomer, Wanda Diaz, lost her sight after a protracted illness and still... And what people have been able to do, mainly visually, for hundreds of years, now I do it using, using sound. Sonification also excites researchers because there's a belief that our ears can better pick out patterns from noisy backgrounds than our eyes can, and therefore perhaps it might lend itself better to more complicated data where the signal has picked up a lot of unwanted interference, like that coming from particle collisions. And that brings us nicely to the Higgs boson, which was measured at the Large Hadron Collider at CERN. The data in question is collected when two proton beams are successfully smashed together, producing an explosion of particle debris and a simultaneous explosion of dilettantes trying to make a name for themselves. Here's a TED talk given in Geneva by a person from CERN who was involved in trying to sonify this data. And at this time I became a bit interested. I wondered what an electron would sound like. So to achieve this, they measured two things, the particles themselves and the amount of energy belonging to each one. But since a collision happens so incredibly quickly, time as we understand it isn't really a factor. So to get around this, they looked at the position of each particle and read them in a clockwise motion to determine the order that we hear them in. I mean, you can already close the book on the idea that this is the sound of the particles at this point, but let's carry on anyway. They then represented the amount of energy contained in each particle using pitch. If it's high energy, high pitch. This is the most common sonification technique. When there's more of something, raise the pitch. Anyway, the presenter goes on to assure us of the scientific rigour being used here. The science is in these arrows. We don't just create a vague relationship between the sonic properties and the physical properties. The relationship has to be exact and rigorous. Sounds very meticulous, but hold on, there's more. The art is in where we place these arrows and which parameters we decide to use. Oh right, so these are just arbitrary decisions. You can map the position of each particle to time, and the energy to pitch, or the other way around, it doesn't matter. Anyway, they mapped a few more aspects of the data to sound. But we wanted to try something a little bit more ambitious with the real data. So we went for a four to six mapping. It looks a bit messy and complicated. Yeah, you don't say. God, you're presenting a TED. Could, could you not tidy that up? Here, look, it's, I'll do it. Anyway, after all this, behold, the sound of the Higgs boson.
So now we've quite clearly divided those two things. We don't know if you've done it right, but it was, it was fun trying. <laughs> so it is completely arbitrary, the sounds you get out, really. Some of it paid for by you, um, some element of your tax. Okay, so let me be fair. I'm guessing this was actually part of an experiment to see if there was a new way insight could be derived from sonification of particle collisions. Although the presenter doesn't actually come out and say that, which I find strange because that's the most interesting part, right? I mean, without that we're being led to believe that all we're doing is listening to the particles, which is obviously nonsense. But then I found this statement on the CERN website about how they'd found similarities between the sound of the Higgs and well-known scores in classical music. And I have to admit, my first thought was, oh boy, I got you now. It became clear that the Higgs boson sonification contains Beethoven's Fifth Symphony. Oh right, they were they were joking. Uh, Jesus, does anyone ever do any work at CERN? But enough about particles, let's move on to planets. Here the problem of misrepresentation gets way worse. Listen to this now fairly famous example of the sound of Saturn, recorded by the Cassini spacecraft and published by NASA. Wow, sounds amazing, no? Well, unfortunately, this is in no way the sound of Saturn, because what's been measured are radio waves, you know, from the light spectrum, which is then converted to the sound spectrum, which as we all know, is fundamentally a different thing. Even then the wavelengths are dramatically shortened so they fall within the range of hearing, and you can add on top of that a liberal use of audio effects so the result sounds grandiose and awe-inspiring. It is completely arbitrary, the sounds you get out, really. You see, the act of sonifying data all too regularly ends up contaminated by a human bias for what we imagine things should sound like. With a basic abstract sound, you're allowing the listener to understand the trigger that provoked it. In a way, you're exposing the mechanics so that the truth behind the data is revealed. When you begin manipulating tone, sonority, texture, etc., you begin adding irrelevant human bias and unnecessary noise. It is completely arbitrary, the sounds you get out, really. Here's a pretty well-known example by Robert Alexander, who was tasked with sonifying data from the sun, which was then presented to the public by various media outlets as the sun's music. Every single piece of that music is driven in some way, shape or form by that data. And all of the choices in terms of the rise and the fall all of them relate back to the underlying data, and all of them are true to the data in some way, shape, or form. Of course, the sun doesn't generate anything remotely like this, and despite the sound designer's assurance that the data is being reflected accurately, it's still being ridiculously shortened so that the full rotation of the sun is represented in a few seconds, and the sounds that are chosen are, well... It is completely arbitrary, the sounds you get out, really. But on the plus side, this experiment led to a discovery that sonification could track the solar winds more accurately than previously known methods. So it's both really cool and really dumb. Where it represents the possibility of improved scientific understanding on the one hand, it completely obscures that understanding from the general public on the other, instead selling us contrived myths about how the universe works, literally the opposite of what science is supposed to do. But as much as scientists can misuse this technique, composers take it to a completely different level altogether. You see, writing music is sometimes soul-destroying, spending days and days pursuing a creative idea with nothing to show for it at the end. It's understandable then that some composers want to find something to aid them in the process of creation, and there's a certain allure to the idea of readily available data which can basically write your music for you. Now before I tee off, I should mention that there's always a way to use a technique artistically. Take this short work by Jim Briggs and Michael Corey, who were commenting on the Orlando Massacre in 2016. They used data based on the lifespan of each victim to form an ever-growing mixture of sound. But despite the multiple different trajectories that you can hear, the sounds all have one thing in common. They all end at the same time. In other words, the data was used as a tool to accomplish a dramatic statement. But all too often for other composers, the data is the statement. I mean, how many times have I heard a piece based on climate change data? He came to me with a set of data with the task of turning it into a piece of music and we wound up with a song of our warming planet. My name is Dan Crawford 
and I'm a student at the University of Minnesota. I've been working with Dr. Scott St. George to turn climate data into climate music. So what's the comment here? The temperature gets higher, so the pitch gets higher. Yeah, I get it. This isn't a statement, it's crap encryption. No different from simply handing someone a piece of paper with the stats written on it, except less accurate and more time consuming to understand. And this leads to my least favorite use of sonification, blatant emotional blackmail. Here's a tutorial. Just find statistics on a really emotive topic like domestic abuse, inequality, or child mortality. Hey presto, instant concept. Now hook the data up to create some music, taking care that it sounds appropriately sad, and boom, you have successfully passed from concept to execution in time for tea with zero transformative insight. And the best part is that no one with half a brain is going to criticize you for doing this because they don't want to be seen on the wrong side of an argument about sexism or racism or dead babies. And I'm not going to make that mistake either. There's no way I'm naming names here because we all know what the internet is like. I've laid out my critical tools and it's up to the listeners to apply them as they see fit because there are tons of composers who do this. It's really cheap and the result invariably sounds rubbish too. So the next time a composer comes up to you and says, hey, I took the data from suicide bombings in Iraq over the last 10 years and hooked it up to a synthesizer, your next question should be, oh yeah, and what? So to finish up, let's have a bit of fun. Here's a quick piece I created based on the analytics of my recent Eurovision video. I took two days worth of data tracking the number of hourly views I got from four countries. Each hour gets a sound, and the higher the number of views in that hour, the higher the pitch. Uh, well, that's in real time, so we'd be waiting another hour for the next sound. Let's shrink it down so that an hour equals roughly a second. Okay, well that doesn't sound very good. Let's use a better synthesizer, and let's assign each country a nice sounding instrument. Let's also separate the notes out slightly and keep everything within the key of C. Ah. What a transformation. The overall effect gives the impression of something amazing and almost transcendent. The underlying hum of human connection. The sound of the internet. Scientists and composers need funding, and therefore often find it very hard to refrain from cheapening their work by appealing to simplistic biases and assumptions, with the media as their ever-willing accomplice. In the case of scientific data, it's way too commonly framed as music, giving the impression of some unknowable cosmic unity and leading hippies all over the world to jump to vague conclusions about the oneness of everything. The technique has the potential to be an extremely useful tool for learning, but requires that the listener is allowed to know how the sound was generated in the way that I just did here. Otherwise what you're sending out is about as meaningful as an encrypted copy of 1984. And as for composers who use this technique to leech off emotive topics, I've created this sonification just for you. It represents the scope of your artistic insight and prowess. Thanks very much for watching. Um, not much to say about this one except if you liked it and you haven't subscribed, please do. Uh, otherwise, if you could send it on to anyone who you think might get a kick out of it, that would be fantastic too. I'm not certain what my next video is going to be about. Um, any suggestions would be welcome. Um, if you are so inclined, I have a Patreon page and it would be lovely if you could contribute towards that. But don't worry too much because it's sort of early days for this channel. Uh, you may have also noticed that the vocal quality uh, of these recordings isn't quite as good as my previous videos. That's because I've moved to a new house, I have a new studio and I need to get it treated for acoustics and then we'll be up to a proper professional standard. Uh, what was I going to say? Oh, also likes I've discovered are kind of important. I didn't think they were, but when I got a, a number of likes in my Eurovision video, it suddenly went into orbit. Orbit relative to my other videos, I've only hit 16,000 views, but that's uh, more than all the other ones put together. Um, anyway, spread the word, share the love, say hello to your mom. goodbye.